Good morning, friends from New York City. Even though you can't really, you can't tell that I'm but you can that I am in a hotel room based on the messiness. We're, we're packing, getting ready to go to the airport today. And I thought I'd take you along with me and do a Q&A answering some of the most asked questions around technology, coding, career. I got a lot of questions around my transition from software engineering into uh, developer relations, developer advocacy. So we're gonna cover all of that and more in this video. Before we get into it though, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more tech, coding, career related content. And okay, let's just get, let's dive into these questions. So I have the questions here in front of me. And one of the top questions was, do you enjoy your new role as a developer advocate? If so, what skills would you recommend one build to transition into that field? It sounds like a nice role of being creative and technical. Yes, I completely agree. It's And that's what really struck me about this role is the creativity and technical aspects combined. So for those of you who don't know, I transitioned into uh, developer advocacy, into the developer relations world from software engineering. I was doing software engineering for five years and wanted to grow in my career. And for me, looking at the different paths to grow as a software engineer, one stood out to me was the developer relations way. And that is because I love mixing creativity with technology, with coding, and, and it's a really great role that combines them both. You need to typically, actually, let me put a disclaimer here. Every company handles developer relations very different. So what I'm saying is just based on my experience, and I feel like I need to qualify that because uh, some companies developer relations is much more marketing focused. Other companies developer relations and roles within it is much more engineering focused. But essentially the role is a mixture of both, of the marketing side of things, the engineering side of things, the product side of things. You wear many different hats. And what it really entails is, what it really can entail is you need to have very strong technical skills or an understanding of the technology that is being used because at the end of the day, you are speaking to developers, you are speaking to other engineers in how to best use your technology or product. And as you know, developers and engineers, they can sniff out if you're like, you know, beating around the bush or not getting to the point quickly or you don't understand what you're talking about. So you really need to feel comfortable and confident in what you're speaking about. And how you reach out to other developers or engineers is through a variety of ways, whether it be public speaking, making coding tutorials, uh, documentation, what else is it? Um, hosting workshops. Basically what you are doing is you are creating a community around your technology or product, educating others to use it and get excited about it. Okay, I feel like that's a lot, but that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. So I kind of break it down into three areas community, content, and education. So that's kind of how you have to look at it is there are multiple aspects to it. And I don't know, that's what really excited me because it's very similar to what I do with Tiffin Tech where I educate you or share with you new technologies or resources I'm loving, do some coding tutorials, um, but also create a community, you know, answer your questions like I'm doing now and connect with you all. So. I hope that brings some clarity into what a developer advocate does. Uh, leave though in the comments if you, have, if you have more questions around it or if you want to see a full day in the life vlog of what exactly I uh, get up to. Hi friends. Okay, we are back, different location. Um, and we're back in actually Toronto in Canada. We flew home last night and I thought I would finish the Q&A that I started yesterday while I get ready and um, let's just answer some more questions. Okay, the next question that I got asked quite a bit was, how did you deal with the fear, anxiety, or any of that for your first internship or job as a software developer? <coughs> Sweetheart, it's okay. Okay, continue. Mug, you gotta stop, baby. I love you so much. Sorry. Someone is being a crybaby because they're dead just left and took Harry to the vet. It's okay, we don't need to crack. He's coming right back. Anyways, if you hear a little bit of whimpering in the background, he's okay. He just, um, he's a bit of a drama queen. Um, how did I deal, deal with fear and anxiety? 
I think for me, one of the biggest things was finding a community or speaking about it because what I found was when you are alone dealing with this, with this anxiety, with this fear, it can overcome you to the point where you almost like, I, there were times where I was like, this isn't for me, I, I need to not do this. And that is very overwhelming. So what I did was I just found people I could connect with and I didn't have those connections in tech. I didn't know anyone else in tech when I started. And that's really why I started to tech, but okay, we are back, apologies. Uh, Mugsy ended up going with Paul because he was just losing it. Anyways, uh, moral of the story is though, find your community, find people that you can trust to really have those candid conversations with. Okay, this is a great question. I'm currently learning how to code and want to know your thoughts about no code and low code. Should I keep learning on coding? Like learning how to code. That is a great question and I get that a lot too because there's of course so much more low code options coming up that a lot of people when they're starting out their career or learning to code, they're like, is there a point to it? And my answer is this, if you want to learn how to code or you're learning to code, I think there is so much more value, so much value you will get out of it that don't just look at it as, will AI take over my job? Because at the end of the day, AI is gonna take over a lot of jobs. The skills you will develop learning to code can be so transferable into other parts of technology. You can continue to grow like building blocks, so learning the fundamentals. And then as you grow in your career, you can specialize in AI, in um, data science, and so many different areas in the cloud that, yes, still learn how to code. AI will take over parts of web developers' jobs eventually. They'll also take over a ton of other jobs. And the key thing here is, the skills you are learning today will very much so be applicable in the future because tech really forces you to be a forever learner that you're constantly learning and growing. Uh, so it's one of those things that yes, still learn how to code knowing that it's just a forever learning process, but it does get easier once you know the fundamentals. Okay, another question is, what advice could you give to someone who wants to be part of IT but doesn't have a background in STEM, uh, specifically math? That's a great question. I think there's a stigma that you have to be a math expert to get into STEM or coding in general, and it's completely not true. Of course, math is required depending on what way you specialize in or go in, and, and it's one of those things that for me anyways, when I started my coding journey, I really didn't know math, like I was terrible at math. But then as you learn to code and grow your technical skills, your way of thinking changes, and it's this whole new way of thinking, and in turn, I found myself slowly but surely becoming better at math or that way of thinking and it just organically happens. So my advice to that is no matter where your skill set is at today, don't base that on what you are or are not capable of. You're continuing to grow, continuing to learn and even if you're bad at math today, in the future you might be really good at it or you might choose a role instead that doesn't require a lot of math which there's a ton of math developers that don't use a lot of math. There's a ton of roles that you don't need to do that so don't let that, don't let that stop you. I feel like I put stuff on my face and it doesn't do any differences. Okay, one more question. Let's wrap it up with a good question. Okay, I got some questions about imposter syndrome, which I'm going to answer in a separate video. Um, there's a lot of questions around making connections in the tech industry, which once again, for me, was just like actually just reaching out to people on LinkedIn. I know that's very overused advice, but you just have to rip the bandaid off and start doing it. Start reaching out to people that you want to connect with, asking for a 15 minute call at their convenience. And you'll be surprised just how quickly people, how nice people are really. They're just like, yeah, sure. And especially if you have set questions you want to ask, don't waste their time. Have a purpose for the call, even if it's as simple as you want to learn more about what they're doing. Okay, we are ready for the day. Gotta go do some work now. And um, I hope you enjoyed this q and It's a very candid, relaxed Q&A, so I don't know. I, don't know. I hope you enjoyed it, but I just really wanted to connect with you. And um, a lot of you have been saying in the comments too, you really enjoyed my Google Chrome extension I made. So if you want, let me know what other ideas you want for projects. I was thinking of doing my next coding project on here to be a, uh, like how to build your first portfolio for whatever you're in, but like code your first portfolio, um, even if you're not going to a coding role necessarily, but just showing that, hey, I made this really cool project. So I think that would be the next project. If you have any other questions, leave them down in the comments. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and I will see you soon. Thanks everyone.